drugs. So let's bring in uh, Teru Clavel and her daughter, Victoria, from New York. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having us. And I'm sorry I don't have a copy of World Class to hold up. It's been in my office, which I haven't seen for a while. So thank you both very much for being with us. Um, Teru and Victoria, I'm going to throw you the same question. And, and, and please, uh, in any order you want to reply. So what are some of the things you learned that we can do better with education in this country when you had that really fascinating exposure to Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Tokyo? Um, what comes to mind, I think it's appropriate for what's going on in, in our country right now, uh, would be the first thing that comes to mind is really equity. I mean, I don't think it's any coincidence that where I educated my three kids, and this is Victoria, she's 11 now. Uh, my older two are 16 and 14, but when we lived in Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Tokyo, equity was was probably the, one of the top priorities, if not the priority. And those countries now already have kids back in school. And basically what that meant was, even in, when we lived in China, the population was you know 1.35 million. The central government did everything in their power to make sure that every child, regardless of socioeconomic background, level of parental education, and however geographically remote uh, their locations may be, that every child got a top-level education with top-level expectations. Um, so we're suffering from that right now in this country, as we see. Um, and there's now been research that shows, you know, the, the, the more well-off educated the parents are, especially during the pandemic, the kids are suffering less uh, academically and social emotionally. So I would say that's one thing that I learned. Um, and the, the other, I talk about a lot of these themes, uh, or several themes, I should say, but the seven, second one I would say uh, that's very big is the family school partnership. And it was, and I, and, I, and I talk about this a fair amount in my book, I felt like when I came back to the United States, there was so much finger whacking and blaming between the families and the schools mm -hmm. and then, maybe the, the, the child, the student would get in between, whereas the number one, um, I guess, aside from equity, the, the most important um, relationship or the most important variable in the school is really the teacher and investing in getting the most qualified teachers in the school and investing in their professional development and their retention. Um, and, you know, there, there are plenty of stories where you give a teacher you know, just a dirt field and a stick, and they, if they're qualified and we invest in them, they can teach anyone. They don't need all the all the bells and whistles, so to speak. And those countries where we lived really did that, and it was very apparent. Yeah. We invite your questions, of course, for Drew Clavel and her daughter, Victoria. Victoria, can I turn to you? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you're in the fifth grade now? Are you going to school mostly remotely there in New York? Well, um, we might go remote again, but right now all of my school is in person. Good for you. Yeah, Are... for the first week they were remote and they went uh, in person um, a handful of weeks ago. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I ask, but our daughters are in a, what do you call it, hybrid. hybrid. Yeah, hybrid, hybrid situation. Some days there, some days not. One of the things that your book talks about is that is that American schools seem to be in love with technology, and there was there was not so much the reliance on technology when you were overseas. And yet now, of course, we have to rely on technology for almost everything. Um, I wonder well, I, what did you I, notice? plenty of research that shows that technology is not necessarily good for our kids. You know, kids are overly reliant on social media and there's so much cyberbullying and, and fake news and, you know, that disinformation is really a problem. Um, and when I lived in Shanghai, it was, it was startling because the, basically the only technology in the room was the electricity with, with the lights on. Um, and and that it was very similar in Japan. I could say if people said technology would probably be the, the sewing machines in the home ec room or the big old school desktop computers just accumulating dust in the computer lab. 
Um, so we're definitely at a point in, 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 in the U.S. where we don't have longitudinal research that really shows the positive effects and the best practices for using technology in our classrooms. That said, we didn't have any other choice, right? Um, yeah. And, and, it, and it really is unfortunate. There's been research that's shown um, just in the last year, you know, that remote learning is not as strong, which I would definitely agree with. But I'll also be the first person to say it is our best alternative right now, and I don't want to jump on the bandwagon where people are just saying, you know, it's terrible, it's the worst. It's the best that we can do, and there's so many people trying their best, from the teachers and the parents and the students to the communities, policymakers. I mean, can we do better? Certainly. Is it, you know, we are so decentralized in the United States, too, that there isn't an answer for every school system, and the needs of all of our schools and families are so different as well. Um, but I, I, I would say absolutely before there were issues, there's that disintermediation between the student and the teacher, which leads to social emotional issues as well. Um, you have privacy concerns, you do have continued cyberbullying, and like you mentioned at the beginning of this, I mean, you know, we have higher truancy rates than we've had in the past, and kids are failing at a higher rate. Um, I mean, kids are really, really resourceful they're even inventing bots that can sign on for them in place of signing on to their classes themselves and teachers don't really know what to do yeah our 17 year old you ought to see at least face well i think you can see she's on the other side of the cabin you can see her face no, she sees you. oh she sees me well that's not <laughs> you should look at Elise. wow i didn't know that oh uh, we have questions that are coming in for the clavels mm -hmm. um what is one thing you change about education in the u.s what is the one thing I would change? Yeah. Um, I would, well, aside from the equity and the teacher issues, which I, which I just mentioned, I would say universal, accessible, high quality early childhood education, starting at two years old, um, and having those community supports uh, from the time a child is born. I think that would, you know, we have, we have so much research already that shows that those early years and anything, every child in education yeah. has ongoing life term, uh, lifetime uh, positive, you know, outcomes. And we don't do that as a nation, and I think we really, really should. Um, I mean, there are a lot of things I'd like to change, but if there was one thing, that would be, that would be primary. Some of, the, uh, some of the equity issue, uh, as you point out in the book, begins with the fact that property tax is habitually used to, uh, as the source of funding for schools. And so, um, you know, obviously communities... Um, in higher, you know, that uh, the, have more tax revenue available commonly uh, will spend more on schools. All of that being said, I must, as a, um, as a reporter point out, and, you know, when people have talked about the troubles in urban school systems have pointed out, urban school systems play, you know, pay plenty per student. Uh, and, you know, and they, and they, uh, in any event, people who run urban school systems, um, frequently complain about about other things in addition to that they uh, you know they say that a, a bureaucracy is sometimes a, a problem with which they have to contend uh, also if, if I might you talk about the, the lack of national standards here's here's a uh, or standard dedication here's something that I noticed today we often think of that that there are localities and inevitably it you know, seems to be some small community somewhere that decides we don't want to read To Kill a Mockingbird uh, or we don't want to read, uh, we don't want our children to read another book because they think it's too progressive, too liberal, something like that. I noticed today there are members of the school board in Berkeley, California, that don't want the children to read To Kill a Mockingbird because they think that the, the book is, is outdated. Uh, and is an unfortunate view of, uh, of race mean, and paternalism. You, so as a result, everybody in Berkeley is going to be reading it? Well, <laughs> <laughs> knowing Berkeley as we do, <laughs> that, might, uh, that might be the case. But um, in any event, what, 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 would that really be an advantage to change to some kind of national standards in a country as large and varied as the U.S.? It was an interesting point, right? Because Arnie Duncan was um, highly criticized for uh, being behind the Common Core, 
Um, and I talk about that, and I said basically those are guidelines. If anybody's actually taking the time to read what the Common Core state standards are, you know, it's it's very amorphous. Yeah. And when you look at the more centralized curriculums in other countries, whether or not you talk about France or those in East Asia, they're much more specific. I mean, they get into exactly what you're doing arithmetic and how you're doing arithmetic, um, and what books you're reading very specifically. And so, I think, I mean, I, I don't. I do think we should be reading to Kevin Martin. I think if you don't read about history, you're going to repeat history. And I think it's socially responsible to to not uh, forget about these these times in our these these really pivotal times in our in our history. Mm-hmm. Um, but we are so diverse. We're not as homogeneous as, as for instance, Japan, where we lived for four years. Um, so there is a lot of. Um, I think teachers in the classroom and the schools themselves have to decide a lot of the curriculum because it has to be specific for the region that they're that they're educating their kids to to one day live in, right? When I wrote my book, I spent a lot of time. I traveled across the country and visited urban, rural, suburban, all kinds of schools. And I got to tell you, you know, in upstate New York, they're trying to figure out how to keep these kids to stay in the areas and and in those areas and support the local economies. And if you don't teach about the local area, then it's going to be really hard to keep them there because everybody yeah. wants to move to urban areas, which is really the the trend. Um, so I guess it's a mixed answer, but I think a fully centralized curriculum isn't the way to go. I do think there should be higher standards, and I do, do think that we have a national problem where we are increasingly lowering our learning expectations mm-hmm. um, at, the expense of, at the expense of our kids. Victoria, may I put you on the spot for a moment? Sure, yeah. Thank you. Um, Our children, who were 17 and 14, um, get to use the internet for five minutes a day Mm -hmm. to be able to write thank you notes to their parents. What about you? (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, do, did your family put limits on your screen time? No, I make her handwrite them, by the way. I wouldn't let her use the internet to write the, hand, to write the, yeah. to the notes. But yeah, anyway, <laughs> go ahead, sorry. Um, not really, but um, I have a lot of after-school activities and other things. So normally I don't have like enough time to spend like hours on technology. And normally when I'm on my computer, I'm either like Zooming with a teacher or with friends, or doing my like, school homework. And how are you able to keep up with your different languages? Um, so I have a Japanese tutor and a Chinese tutor, and I also um, I also go to Japanese school on Saturdays, oh. and it's about four hours long. So yeah, that's wonderful. Oh my God! I, I will say. Japanese school so that she can keep up with the national curriculum of Japan um, and it's subsidized by the Japanese government so that's what she does and it requires the families to homeschool so that's why she has her Japanese tutoring um, and it's, yeah. it's all subsidized which is, which is really really lovely and Victoria spends every summer we did it this past summer uh, but since we moved she spends every summer living in Tokyo and going back to the school that she attended while we lived there you know, I don't want to personalize anything. We have one member of this family who doesn't like the hour of French tutoring that she gets in our household. Why don't we offer the alternative of four hours of Japanese? Well, we have actually, because one of Elise's friends um, does yeah. the same thing. She does. Um, She's graduated. She just graduated from uh, Saturday Japanese school, and I've, which is at least four hours, right? And a lot of work. Yeah. So oh. I've offered that to Paulina, but she's not interested. <laughs> <laughs> Chinese would seem to be more on the plate anyway, but still French. French is uh, our family's French. Uh, other questions for the Clavels. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on standardized testing? Uh, it's such a good question. Um, I have very mixed feelings about standardized testing. I think when it's formative, um, well, usually standard assessing is summative. You know, I'll, I'll tell one anecdote. I spent quite a bit of time in a high school in Santa Clara, uh, California, and they I, I spent a lot of time in a history class, and it was an AP 
U.S. history class and an eight economic class. So I talked to the teacher and I said, so how do your students do on the AP? And, you know, it's out of a, a five-point scale. And he said, I don't know. And I kind of looked at him, what do you mean you don't know? He said, I never get this, I never get the results. And I get them after they graduated, so it doesn't really matter. And I think that's really illustrative of a point. Like, what's the point? Um, especially if the kids can't get credit. So that's one kind of standardized test. Um, I think the SAT, it's very interesting that it used to be called the Scholastic Aptitude Test because it measured aptitude or was supposed to, and now it's just referred to as the SAT. And I think it's really unfortunate that you can study for it and kind of gain that. I worked with international students who applied to U.S. universities who are very, very good at doing that and can get perfect scores. Um, I, I'm not saying that I'm 100% a proponent for this, but I do like having the tests for university entrance be more content specific. Um, we have uh, different backgrounds that don't allow that to necessarily be fair in the United States. Um, what other standardized tests? I think this year will be a big issue, obviously, because to get federal funding, a lot of the states have to, the schools have to provide results to the Department of Education. And obviously this year, the kids aren't getting the same levels of education. So when Biden comes in, sorry to make this political, whether or not he, he continues to make that happen, I'm not quite sure, but um, I think it's I think it's very difficult when it can be created. And that's something that we have to think about in this mm -hmm. country. Other questions for the Clavels? Mm -hmm. Um, well, there's one, there are multiple for Victoria, actually. Um, what does school and education mean to you? Well, for me, I feel like school and education is really important. And my mom says that if my generation doesn't get education, then like, what? <laughs> Go ahead, try. Like, if our generation doesn't get education, then she feels that I kind of feel like the next generation will, and then the next, and the next, because then we won't have anybody to teach, like, our children and their children. Mm. So I feel like I try to work really hard in school and, like, with all of my tutors and stuff, because I want to be, like, a really good teacher to my kids, just like my mom is. Oh, oh my God, that is wonderful. Um, one of the points that you that you make, Teru, in Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Tokyo, teaching is uh, teaching occupies a different a different place in the hierarchy of professions, doesn't it, than it does here? Other questions uh, for Victoria and Teru Clavel. Um, where is it? Where'd it go? I notice. Oh, yeah. Good. Does too much forced schooling make young people resent school? <laughs> um, what's, what do you think is too much? Uh, they remember, didn't say. They, the person didn't comment on how much. I mean, it's a little bit like, you know, and I, and I, I, 
I catch myself doing this is when I tell our children, oh, you have to read this. It's a classic. Even as the words leave my mouth, I know I'm making it impossible for them to read that book and enjoy it. The, uh, I don't want to embarrass our director, but she went through a delightful period when she was younger, where when I went to work, she assumed it was school. Uh, and she had, uh, you had, uh, what was it, Friday was your share day? And she would ask me on Fridays what I was going to share on share day. <laughs> <laughs> and um, in any event, I you know I that that period of time lasted about three weeks, but I will never forget it. Uh, let, let's uh, get a couple more questions for the Clavels and let them get back to this. And actually, now dinner. on Fridays you do share a lot. Uh, now on Fridays <laughs> I do share a lot. That, no, you're right. you're right. As a matter of fact, that's, uh, that's absolutely true. Yeah, that was a, oh yes, baby. Uh, yeah. What are your thoughts on Greta Th Thunberg? Both of you. <laughs> oh. oh. Interesting. Um, so actually my next project, I have two projects I'm working on right now that are about educating Gen Z for their futures and how, to, how they can deal with the problems that they have inherited from, from us. Um, and I think I love her as a model, as an influencer, as someone who is an advocate. I do believe she, to get this, to get to make change happen, it needs to be a multi-generational, multi-stakeholder kind of collaborative um, effort. And I fear that she doesn't have that. Um, and I and I think she's done wonders. I think people are much more aware of climate change and mitigating that. But I do think that the model for the future has to be um, not just one, but a huge network um, to combat the, the ills that we're facing. And so I hope that's that's the next generation of Greta Thunberg. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Oh, well, um, I think that she's like a really big inspiration to especially like younger people who also want to make a change. And I feel like by doing what she did, she made like all of these problems more realistic and make made everyone like think deeper about them. And I admire her for that. Oh, that's wonderful. Let's take one last question. Elise, what do you think uh, looks best? Our judges are consulting Clavels. Let's see. Um, Oh, that's a, this is a comment, but it's such a nice one. Oh, uh, somebody says Victoria is our future, and she gives me great hope. Oh. Oh. Oh, that oh, that's really nice. Oh, well, there's a good question. Wait, come back up here. Oh, all right. Wait. Yeah. Uh, up, up, up. This one. 
Um, should we focus more on trades, more plumbers, less lawyers? Um, I think it's a great question. I do feel, and this is just my opinion, I do feel like we put way too much of an emphasis on everybody going to college in this country, and I think there's nothing wrong with pursuing um, a specific skill in in doing schooling. Um, and I think I, I, I should say that that is supported by our high tuitions that are that have to be needed as well. I, I do think it's it's un very unfortunate. Is a nice way of saying how cost prohibitive our, our university tuitions are, even at the state level. Um, and a lot of other countries that have thriving education systems with much higher academic outcomes than we have, uh, respect those courses, right? To go to, um, whether it be a plumber, electrician, a chef, whatever it may be, becoming a um, radiation uh, technician. Um, and, and, I, and I don't think we should have a problem with that. Uh, but right now, our model doesn't really accept that as much uh, yeah. societally, and, and I wish we could shift that. I, I would, uh, I, I would also add. I, I think it's important for people who are plumbers, radio technicians, and other people that we need so vitally in the society that they that they have a chance to learn about literature and learn about philosophy and learn about history and. You know, I, I I think that's I think that makes us all better citizens in a better country and have that that kind of shared common background uh, of experience. I can't thank you both enough. Um, the uh, they're they're conferring. I think there's another question we might throw your way. No. No. Okay. They're conferring. I I can't thank you both enough. And and we want to say to uh, folks who are joining us out there, thank you very much. We know things are. Uh, are tough and we do appreciate all the time that you're spending with us tomorrow we're going to talk to a funny economist uh, justin wolfers who um, i like to think he's the man who figured out you know why there was this run on toilet tissue and hmm. he'll talk about the narrative possibilities of that and we're going to begin with a reading from john kenneth galbraith's uh, great memoir and we want to thank the uh, the clavels for being with us tonight uh, the wonderful book they've done is world class and it um, raises, in, in telling us about, about other forms of education in other societies, it raises questions about our own, and there is uh, no more kind of important work to be done. So uh, to both Daru and Victoria Clavel, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks to everybody who's keeping our lives going. Um, we are very grateful people in agriculture, people in hospitals, and we say this many nights, but particularly tonight, let us say teachers. And teacher and administrators. Say, and can I say something as well? I volunteered my, today. My, my wife was a volunteer at our at daughter's school, today. school And what I ended up doing was just wiping all the tables and all the pens and everything that was used. And I spent the whole afternoon doing that. And you realize it's such a taxing thing for yeah. educators to be doing now. They don't do that. We do it. Well, in this case, I did it, but no, a lot. Of, uh, they, well, a lot of the teachers were helping me because between er, between each yeah. child who came in, we were wiping down all the desks, the chairs, the pens. It's an enormous additional task in addition to teaching. And also, my other responsibility was making sure the girls weren't too close to each other, that they didn't group. And that was the hardest thing. Every time I would come up to a few girls who were not six feet apart, they would look at me like, what are you doing? It was really hard. It's important, but really hard. And that's an additional task that teachers have. For sure. I, I, I just would like to say and, and share the same sentiment. I talk to teachers all the time, and they are working so hard, and many are leaving the field because it's too much for them. And I do hope that if there's anything we can reimagine through this, it's that we really invest far more heavily in our teachers. Yeah. Amen. Very well said. Well, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight in our open book. Good.